go back to the days where either your dog was a young puppy or maybe when you first brought him home. When you walked in the house, it was like a scene from a movie where the sailor has been at sea <laughs> and at war for years and it's the homecoming on the ship dock, right? And you're like, my dog! And you're kissing and hugging and making out on the floor. And the dog is like, this is amazing. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Dog Sense. I am here with my co-host, Sarah. Hey, Sarah. Hey, guys. Tonight's a good topic. This is one that we hear from students all the time. Yes. And we know what this means and we know how to fix it and we know how you're actually causing it to happen. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to tell them what the topic is. Ready? It's barking. Yay, yep. barking. Such a common one. And a lot of times people will call and the only thing that they want, they don't care about obedience, nothing. They're literally like, I just need you to get my dog to stop barking when they're doing this. I know. We're like, how about teaching them to come so they don't get hit by a car or stay so you can pick up broken glass? They're like, nope, don't care. Nope. Just need them to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, and one of the most common ones that we'll start off with is the barking when they come home. It's incessant, like they just won't stop. The second they hear the car pull in the driveway, the dog just starts losing his mind barking. All right. So let's talk about this. Go back to the days where either your dog was a young puppy or maybe when you first brought him home. When you walked in the house, it was like a scene from a movie where the sailor has been at sea <laughs> and at war for years and it's the homecoming on the ship dock, right? And you're like, my dog! And you're kissing and hugging and making out on the floor. And the dog is like, this is amazing. <laughs> and pretty soon what you start to notice is you don't actually need to come home and say all the keywords that you do, which is like, oh, where's my boy, right? <laughs> dog starts to notice and start the greeting behavior when they hear the doorknob turn. And then when they hear your footsteps coming up the driveway or down the hallway, and they're smart enough to eventually get to the point where they hear your car coming down the street, they act like a lunatic because they're like, yes, the game is going to start. And then you're like, I don't know how this happened. <laughs> Let's let's rewind the video a few months. Let's, let's look at this and how do you. So, but we do know the answer, right, Sarah? We're sorry to say this, but you did. You created this, right? Like you created this monster. So now we have to then get a little bit creative and it's going to be different with every dog. But how do we now take the arousal levels way down low when you are coming home? So the first thing we think of is. When you're coming home and your dog is home alone, we would really like your dog to be confined. We prefer a crate. Some people do gating. It's fine. But the key is you have to teach the, your dog that when you enter the home, they are not your first priority. I know you miss them. I know you long for their hugs and their licks and to interact with them and throw yourself on the floor, but you cannot. Because you're just feeding into this. And so if you walk in the house, quite likely your dog is going to start barking and gyrating in the crate like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm here to tell you that if you let them out, you're doing something called rewarding the behavior. So yeah. The dog says, when I act like a lunatic, you open the door and I get what I want. And then that leaks into everything else. That's how they get you to open the door to go to the bathroom. That's how they get you to feed them faster. So it's this demand barking that you've accidentally rewarded because we're sorry you didn't know any better. But thank goodness you have this podcast now to so <laughs> prevent you from creating any more horrible behaviors like this. So that's our number one rule. Come in the house, ignore the dog till they're calm. Mm -hmm. And I, Sarah, can you hear the people saying, but I have a puppy who has to potty. Yeah, that happens. You silently go to the crate, you reach in, you pick up the puppy, you say nothing, you put the leash on, you take him outside. And only after you are outside does the party happen. And that teaches the puppy or the dog that the fun is actually not in the house. The fun is outside. And also, if this is a puppy that's young enough where they still have to potty that quickly when you first come home, you have time to fix this. The behaviors have not been cemented enough where you can't go back and fix this. And with the older dogs, you got to break the pattern. 
get creative. See if you can like, when you walk in the door, if he starts barking and he's not in his crate, which you should be, turn around and walk back out again. You got to find a way to break the pattern and teach him that that crazy barking nonsense is not going to get him what he wants. And you can practice this, right? So yeah, on a weekend when you're home for the day, like pick up your keys and go outside mm-hmm. and like pull your car down the block and come back, like practice that re-entry and reward him for being quiet, not necessarily by letting him out, maybe by going to the crate or the confined area and giving him high value treats Mm -hmm. and then leaving and coming back. Make it so your departure and your arrival Mm -hmm. isn't a big event. And here's a pro tip. Stop narrating what your dog is saying. I I think that's the biggest training destroyer ever. Because if you're saying, oh my gosh, she's saying, mommy, why won't you let me out and hug you? Right. Don't say that. <clears throat> hey, instead, say your dog is going, yo, dude, let me out. Like, I need you right now. Like, hurry it up. If you're going to give a voice, give that voice because it's easier to ignore. All right. So this kind of also bleeds into the next type of barking that we will hear about. And a lot of times with this one, owners don't even realize that they're doing it. So this is demand barking or attention seeking behaviors. <laughs> Yeah. And you know, when they do that, usually the owners are doing something to just get them to be quiet, right? Exactly. You have friends over and the dog is right here. Bark, bark, bark. And you don't even realize you start petting it like just, and and in your mind, you're like, I just want you to be quiet, whatever you need at this moment. But it relates (laughs) back to like kids. Like if kids did this, they're like, mom, 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 mom. Remember that cartoon? What was that? You know, the cartoon. You know, I'm terrible. Any kind of pop culture reference, I'm not going to get it. All right, family guy. Now you have to go Google it. (laughs) And he's like, mom, 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 mom. She's like, what? He's like, it was something. So that's what happens with the dogs. So we also want to talk to you about the extinction burst. When you start ignoring things, like you're going to say, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to pet you. I'm not going to give you a cookie when you bark at me. They -hmm. will escalate and go harder. And that's just a natural part of humans and dogs. Like, for example, this is my perfect example. I go to the elevator and I push the button. And I am convinced that the more I push that button, the faster the elevator is going to come. And sometimes it has. So I'm like, oh, I got rewarded. It's like the vending machine. Let's say every day you go to the vending machine and you put a dollar in and you hit the button and out pops your soda. You do that for months and months and months. And then one day you hit the button and no soda comes out. What do you do? You You hit that button. Yeah, exactly. 45 more times. That's your extinction burst. And guess what? If no soda drops out, you walk away. But if a soda drops out, that's your new norm. Exactly. You as the vending machine. The dog is barking, 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 barking. You're like, okay, here you have the thing. And the dog goes, oh, you got to bark that much to get the thing. Mm -hmm. But if you stay silent, put your AirPods in, just steal your heart, the dog will stop. And then at some point you can reward them for being quiet. Exactly. A really common one for when that demand barking happens is mealtimes. The dogs will start barking and you'll start making the food more quickly to get the, But what you need to do is the opposite. If you start, if the dog, if you're making the food and the dog starts barking at you to get you to hurry up, stop making the food and go watch some TV. What you need to do in that moment is the exact opposite of what every fiber of your being is telling you to do. Do the opposite because you don't want to be reinforcing and rewarding these behaviors. When my dogs see me get the bowls out, they all run in their crates. And God yeah. forbid I have a new puppy. They're like, oh, it's going to take a long time because <laughs> the puppy's jumping. And as soon as they start jumping, I sit down. Yep. I'm like, the meal is not going to begin at all. And yep. then the puppy's like, I don't know what happened. Then they're quiet and they get back up and they start jumping around. I sit back down and they get it pretty quickly. They're like, wow, nothing yep. happens when you're acting like that. Everything good stops. And mm-hmm. so what we like to call that is an unexpected outcome or an unexpected consequence. And it's really just taking away something taking away your progress in making their meal. Yeah, so those are two of the kind of most common, relatively harmless, around the household types of barking things that we hear from clients. The next two that we're going to go into can escalate further and would not be something that, again, we want to continue a uh, behavior that we want to continue. So Wait, uh, before first- we go, Before yeah. we go there, Sarah, I want to talk one more thing about demand barking. Yeah. I had a client about a decade ago, and when she called me up, it was like, hello, this is Kathy. I'm like, hello, I can't hear you. She's like, I can't talk loud. So long story short, she was calling me from her closet. Oh my because God. Because when she talked on the phone, her Sheltie would bark nonstop. 
Mm -hmm. And so the only way she could make a phone call was in her closet if she whispered. And she had been living like this for a very long time. And so when I got her to let the barking extinguish, yeah. it took 17 minutes. She made a fake phone call. And oh. this is back when phones had cords. It was. Yeah, yeah. So that's how long ago it was. And she was pretending to talk and the dog was barking, 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 barking. And she had her little uh, walk, man. That's how long ago it was. <laughs> she had a little air things in, right? Yeah. And she couldn't hear and she steeled herself to it. And eventually the dog stopped. It took a couple reps of that. Yeah. But don't be surprised if demand barking takes a while. And if you have somebody in your house who's a saboteur, you got to get them to stop because yeah. the dog knows they can do it. They're just not going to do it with you, but they're going to do it with him and yeah. her and him. So you got to make sure everybody is on board with this. Yeah. And something really, really important is your consistency. Right. Because like Kathy had talked about with the vending machine and everything, if he does it 45 times and then all of a sudden it works, that's now your new threshold. So your dog is now going to bark for 45 minutes in order to get what they want. So be really like once you're going to commit to this, get the whole family on board, make sure everyone knows the new rules to help make sure that we actually extinguish the behavior. You can also do an unexpected outcome, which is they bark and I'm like, oh, what, sweetie? You want to go in your crate? Okay, baby. And yeah, they yeah. into their crate, they put them in it, close the door. They're like, she's so dumb. That's not what I wanted at all. But the dog is like, oh, you know what? I When I bark, that happens. I don't like it. And yeah. I give it to them like a gift. <laughs> yeah. Like you win the prize. You get to go in your crate. They're like, oh, crap. I didn't want to go in my crate. So, and well, this communication worry. between the species. Yes, yes, yes. And it's not going to ruin your crate thing. I can hear people no. saying that. Oh, my God, he's going to hate the crate. He's not because you're going to gift it to him. Like, here yep. you go. <laughs> All right. So some of the other big ones are one of the next ones we'll go through is territorial barking. So this is the mailman comes up the driveway. They're barking out the window or they're out in the yard. The mailman comes up and they start barking. New people come over. We call that territorial barking usually. Yeah. And a lot of it is set up inadvertently because people let their dogs <laughs> look out the window. Yep. Like. It, and they don't want to take it away. They're like, but my dog likes to watch TV outside. It's no, because the dog barks to people who go by and they're doing it for one of two reasons. They're either barking, going, your mother, get off my property. Right. And then the people leave and the dog is like, yes. Yeah, yeah. And also they bark like, oh, friend, come to me. Oh, friend. they left. And so either one of those is a source of stress mm -hmm. and frustration or victory. And then let me tell you, this impacts healing. When you take yeah. your dog out on a walk, that glass wall is gone. And now the dog is like, opportunity is knocking now. I can get to what I want. So number one rule, restrict or eliminate your dog's ability to look outside and bark at things. It's just, it's not good. And, and besides that, they're probably on top of a couch or something anyway. Yeah. So now we got that whole elevationist status thing. And mm -hmm. you just, you're going down a road that you don't want to go down. Yeah. So, and so blocking. So. <laughs> Do you actually, do you want to tell the story about the garbage bags and the, to the woman who had the, the garbage bags? Oh, oh my gosh. Okay. So <laughs> my student had three Maltese and they were all from the same litter. She couldn't part with the idea of leaving two in the pet store. So she took all three. Let's just not, oh my that's, a whole, that's a different episode. Yeah. Yeah. So she lived on a street on a corner. And when people at night would turn down her street, their headlights would go right into the glass side panels of her front door and they would go wild, like body slamming the glass to get out. <laughs> And, and they would bump into each other. They would be like, oh, it's a thing outside. Then they'd fight within, like within themselves. Like it was just, it was a nightmare. So went to her house. I'm like, we can't let them get to the door. She's like, but there's no way they jump over gates, blah, blah, blah. So the solution was we got black heavy duty trash bags. It was beautiful. And we taped them in the glass panels on the side. And so for weeks, maybe, yeah months we had that going and then we got rid of it and you would have thought thank god it wasn't a cue on the sound of the car right it was really just the visual of yeah yeah then what we progressed to doing was we rolled a little bit up on the bottom like an inch or two like nothing mm -hmm. big and they would see that much light and then that much light and it was a progressional thing but yeah. eventually we got to the point where they didn't but the way she lived was terrible and she tried everything yeah. she tried sounds to spook them it just cranked them up yeah, it's awful, really awful. But the end of the story was that we finally found a solution that worked for her. However, if you have a giant bay window, you're not going to put trash bags on it. Yeah. You've got to get a way to have the dog not get access to that 
window and don't feel bad about it. You can give them a puzzle toy. They'll be fine. They right. can watch people walking by the house. And also think about being proactive. If you're bringing home a new puppy, if you're bringing home a new adult dog, just don't let them learn how, how exciting and how over arousing it can be to bark out that darn window. Close the shades from day one. If they are going to be home alone, not in a crate or something like that, just don't let them learn how much fun it can be for them. And I know it's obvious, but maybe it's not. I should say it. Don't crank your dog up. Don't be yeah. like, oh, who's there? Who's yeah. there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is here. Man, like people just, they think that's so funny. <laughs> and then they call us and they're like, I don't know where it came from. He, he goes nuts when the mailman walks up and we're like. Yeah, right. And then we do an in-home. Yeah. Right. And then we see them do it. Yeah. Like, oh, who's there? It's a mailman. UPS. Ooh, it's DoorDash. I'm like, are you kidding me right now? Don't yeah. do that. Because yeah. it's basically a cue to say, act like an ass. And then I'm going to complain about it. And we're yep. going to do this little dance. So yeah. the first thing you have to do with a behavior is you have to interrupt the cycle. So that pattern mm-hmm. needs to be broken. Yeah. However you have to do that. If it's like well, putting a gate so they can't get to that room or just closing your mouth so you don't say anything, you're <laughs> going to have to retrain. And hopefully your dog is on a leash. So in the yeah. house that you're supervising, right, it's on a six foot leash and you're making sure God forbid, if he got caught, you'd be there, right? Mm-hmm. We we want drag leashes on your dogs who are not trained because when yeah. they go mental at the window, you can step on the leash and move them away and either put them in timeout or mm-hmm. give them something appropriate to do or an appropriate place to be. But it's yeah. really key that you're able to interrupt that because if you're not and it goes on, the dog is just self-rewarding. Yeah. So I think this goes into the last one that we hear from Probably one of the most frequent ones that I hear is when they're on a walk with their dog, they're barking at every single dog they pass or every single person they pass or a car, whatever it is, it's from a state of over arousal. So they're barking because, and you you did a good uh, definition of like, so when they see the, when you're thinking, talking about like when they're going out the window, they're either really excited and they just want to go say hello to them. Or they're saying, get the heck away from me. I don't want you anywhere near me. And that other person was going to continue on their walk no matter what, but the dog doesn't understand that. They think that their behavior has caused this to happen. Right. And so when they're outside, there's the opportunity. Mm -hmm. There's no window. So they are going to be more forceful, more forward. They're going to get the job done, so to speak. And it's really hard. And we as dog trainers... We see the world differently, right? So when somebody's dog is barking and they pet it, yeah, I know they're trying to soothe the dog, but the dog thinks you like that behavior. Yep. So everything you do now, people are shoving food in their dog's mouth when they're barking. And the food idea to distract them is a good one. But if you give it to them while they're cranked up, it's rewarding that behavior. And so they think in order to get that food, they are going to act that way and be rewarded by you. So it's a bit of tricky training. Just You've got to make sure that you're not the reward. You've got to make sure that you understand body language. You got to make sure that your dog is socialized, but doesn't think everything's better than you. And by the way, if your dog is pulling and barking and you're like, oh, he just wants to see that person and you let him. Oh, God. It's like letting him out of the crate when he barks and loses his mind, right? It's really, you have to, a lot of times you start to point this stuff out to clients, they don't even realize they were doing it. Like they don't even realize what they were reinforcing. And the thing with using the food, if you're trying to create a better better response, and when they see other people, the timing is so important in that. And it's about when your dog looks at other person and they don't bark, that's what you want to reward. And if you have a dog who currently does that, and let's say he's new to your home or it's a puppy, reward that. Don't just let that go and think he's going to be like that forever. Reward the behaviors that you want to see more of. So if your dog is walking down the street and they're not barking at other people, they're not pulling and lunging towards them, reward them for that. That's a choice that they're making that you want to see more of. And how about stop being the Uber driver on walks? Yeah. How about stop opening the door, letting the dog out, locking the door behind you, and then texting while you're on a walk or like looking at cloud formations and not being the best part of your dog walk. Your dog probably thinks that a walk, the purpose is bodily functions, sniffing and finding new friends that when he pulls you, let them get to. So how about going on a walk and packing chicken or turkey or roast beef or I don't care His favorite tug toy. It could be literally anything. Anything. Just, and then interact with them. Like go 10, commit to every 10 steps doing something. Yeah. So you're saying his name and running backwards. You're giving him an opportunity to tug. 
And then he doesn't only hear from you when things are going sideways. Yeah. That's part of the problem. You're like, oh my God, stop it. And he's like, oh, you're still here? Yeah. Like, I thought I left it out. You just, you have to change you as well as the dog's behavior because you're a team. Yeah. If you're only trying to fix one part of the team and you're not fixing the other part of the team, it's not going to work out. All right. So I think that those were the main kind of four that we usually hear most from students. If you guys have another one that you would like us to cover, you can send us any suggestions you have for the podcast or any extra questions. You can email us info at kathysanto.com. We would love to be able to do topics that you guys really have questions about. So we can then do that deep dive for you that we do to our in-person clients. All right, Sarah, I think we wrapped up. I think we talked about everything barking. Um, or like you said, at least the most common ones that yeah. we hear every single day. <laughs> exactly. Or it's a big issue with a lot of dog owners and they just, they don't, again, it's a matter of, they don't realize that they are actually most likely reinforcing it a lot of the time. Yeah, they are. But you know, fix- when you create this awareness, everything yeah. changes, not yeah. just the barking issue, but all the issues you have, you just see things differently. We always talk about, it's like that movie, The Sixth Sense, that kid, he saw dead people. Yeah, we see dog fights, we just see dog body language, and we're very fluent, and our goal is to make you fluent as well. Yep, absolutely. All right, guys, thanks for joining us for this episode. Again, any questions, concerns, email us info at kathysanto.com. <laughs>